26. You know, the first few verses there might sound kind of familiar to you if you uh, remember these same group of people um, and the same kind of the same group of people in the same locations are being mentioned here. It says there, and the Ziphites came unto Saul to Gibeah, saying, Doth not David hide himself in the hill of Hekilah, which is before Jeshimon? And Saul rose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph, having 3,000 chosen men of Israel with him. And what's going on here is this is actually uh, you know, the story of the second time when David uh, you know, has mercy upon Saul. And if you remember in chapter uh, 23, there's these identical circumstances that are taking place. It's the same people, it's the Ziphites, that are coming to Saul and saying, hey, David's in the same place. You know, he's before Jeshimon. You know, he's in the wilderness. So it's this exact same set of circumstances. This isn't a retelling of that story because we know that the way it ends is very different in those two stories. You know, the first story, uh, you know, David, you know, confronts him uh, at the cave. And then in this story, of course, um, you know, he's, he's confronting him from a great distance, from a precipice, you know, calling down to him from safety. Because Saul, you know, to somewhat has learned his lesson at this point. He's not just wandering into some cave somewhere, you know, by himself. This time, you know, he's sleeping with all his men around him. He's got his bolster right there. He's got a spear, his crews of water. He's ready to stand up and defend himself. So it seems like Saul's kind of learned his lesson a little bit, but when we really consider the circumstances, it just goes to show us that he really hasn't, at least not to the extent that he should have. Because he should remember, this is pretty, should have been a pretty fresh memory of what happened the last time he pursued Saul when these same people came to him and gave him the exact same sort of circumstances. You know, it didn't turn out so well for Saul. He, he, he escaped very narrowly. So, you know, we'll make applications as we go tonight and get some thoughts. I don't know that I'll be particularly long, but if you would, go over to Proverbs chapter 17. You know, we need to learn our lessons in life. That's a very important thing to keep in mind as we're living our life. Because here's the thing, nobody's perfect. You know, everybody is going to make mistakes. Everybody is going to, you know, do something wrong at some point in their life. You know, especially when you're trying to live the Christian life. And, and, and you're, you've got a different standard than the world. You know, we don't have the standard that the world has where they kind of let things slide. They kind of let us get away with things. You know, what, you know, they might not think something is as big as a deal as it actually is. Okay? So we need to learn our lessons in life. And that's really what Saul should have done here. So he should have learned his lesson. And it kind of, by the end, you know, it does kind of come to his senses a little bit, it seems like, at the end. But it's not long after that that he is, you know, he dies. Okay? And I believe a lot of what happened in later chapters is related to what we see happening in this chapter. But in Proverbs chapter 17, if you would, look at verse 10. It says, A reproof entereth more into a wise man than a hundred stripes into a fool. So it's not that the wise man, you know, here is perfect. It's not that he never makes a mistake. You know, that's not wisdom. You know, that would be, you know, the Bible warns against that, Galatians. You know, take heed lest you fall. Okay? No one's perfect. You know, we're all fallible. We can all make mistakes. Every single one of us. The difference is what makes a person wise is that when they are called on the carpet for it, you know, when they are confronted with their error, they acknowledge it. They say, you know what, you're right, I'm wrong. And that reproof, it says, enters into a wise man. And it says it enters a wise man more than a hundred stripes a fool. You know, I mean, he's saying here, look, you have better luck instructing a wise man with your words alone than you do trying to beat some kind of foolishness out of a fool. You know, even if you were to take a fool who's done something wrong and beat him 100 stripes. Now, this is, of course, you know, making a, 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 an example. It's not saying that we should beat people 100 stripes. In fact, the Bible in the Old Testament says it's a limit of 40, okay? But he's making the point here. Even if you were to go beyond that and just, just beat somebody and beat somebody and beat somebody, you know, if they're foolish, it's not going to do any good. So if you want to be wise tonight, the best thing you could do is learn to receive correction. You know, I've heard it said, and I agree with this, that if a person can receive correction, they will go far in life. But the person that's going to, you know, harden their neck, get puffed up, and not receive correction, you know, they're not going to make it very far in life, and especially not in the Christian life. Because, again, we have a, we have a higher standard. And, you know, we're all going to come short of that. We're all going to make mistakes at some point. The difference is, when that happens, we need to be wise and receive the correction. And, you know, and this also you know, should tell us that it's important to reprove people. You know, if we want uh, other people to be wise, you know, we should take it upon ourselves, you know, if it's appropriate, obviously, and reprove them, you know, when it is appropriate. Now, not every, we don't have to go around and write every wrong that we see out in the world, but this could be especially true, you know, in the home, you know, with parents and children. You know, the foolish parent is going to just let the kid get away with whatever. And then they're going to pull out their hair one day and wonder why their kid is just, you know, running roughshod all over them. Why the kid is just making a mess out of their life. And keep something in Proverbs, we're going to turn to another passage in a minute. 
But the wise parent, you know, will reprove the child. You know, they will give them instruction. They will give them knowledge. They will give them understanding. And there will be, of course, we understand, the corporal punishment that is involved there. And that's really another sermon. But we see what Saul is doing here is that he's failing to learn his lesson. Okay? And we don't want to be like Saul because it doesn't end well when we refuse to learn our lessons in life. <clears throat> now, what else? You know, that's just kind of one point I'm making here. But let's move on here in the story. It says there uh, in verse 3, And Saul pitched in the hill of Hekilah, which is before Jeshimon, by the way. But David of old in the wilderness, and he saw that Saul came after him into the wilderness. And David sent, therefore sent out spies and understood that Saul was come in very deep. So he confirmed <coughs> that he's after him, that he's coming up on him. And, you know, it just seems kind of, you know, I, as I'm reading this, I'm wondering, you know, why is, is David putting himself at risk here? Because we know how the story goes, right? David goes, he finds out where Saul is, and he takes, you know, his men with him, and he goes there, and he takes his, his, his staff, he goes into the camp, into the midst of the enemy, and snatches away the stuff of Saul's, his personal possessions, and then goes up on this precipice and basically wakes Saul up from his nap and says, hey, you know, and calls him out. And it just seems like an unnecessary risk. I mean, and, and you know, just humanly speaking, you look at that, if we were in that circumstance, we would probably think, well, there's my enemy with 3,000 chosen men of war. You know, these aren't, these guys are no slouches. You know, I'm going to get out of here. You know, that, that would be my first inclination. I'm not going to, you know, David is quite the brave guy here. And you kind of have to ask yourself, why would he put himself at risk like this? And, you know, part of the answer might be the fact that he just didn't have anywhere else to go. I mean, he's being hunted. And Saul's looking for him everywhere. He's got spies here. He's got spies there. You know, we see in the next chapter that he ends up in the lands of the Philistines. Right? He actually ends up leaving and departing Israel, which is something he brings up here when he, talks, when he calls out uh, Saul. But, you know, that's probably not the case. It's not just he's in a corner and has nothing left to lose. But I think what's really going on here is that you know, David is, is so bold because his confidence has grown in the Lord. You know, he's been on the run. He's been delivered multiple times by the Lord. He's even seen God deliver Saul right into his hand. And you know, he's done the right thing. He's not touched the Lord's anointed. He knows he's blessed that he's the anointed of the Lord himself. So I believe David here is just acting on the fact that he has boldness. You know, and this is something that we should also take note of, is the fact that, you know, when we go through trials, we go through tribulations, when we have people who are trying to bring us harm, you know, if we're willing to go through those things and trust in the Lord, you know, the next time you go through something like that, it's a little bit easier. You, you wax a little bolder. You have a little bit more confidence when, uh, you know, the next, during the next attack or whatever, you know, the next time you go through some tribulation or trial. So it says there in verse 5, And David arose and came to the place where Saul had pitched. And David beheld the place where Saul lay, and Abner the son of Ner, the captain of his host, and Saul lay in the trench, and the people pitched around him. So he's, he's really taking precautions here. You know, he's down in this little trench. He's got all his guys around him. And, you know, that should tell you something, that he's kind of, he's not messing around this time. He's taking David somewhat seriously. He knows that he's a legitimate threat, which tells me that in the back of his mind, he must know that David is, that God is on David's side. You know, and I, and I believe that's the case, I, and I, especially because of the, way, the things that he says at the end. We'll get to that. But it says, he lay in the trench, in verse 6, and, and, and uh, then answered David and said to Himelech the Hittite, and to Abishai the son of Zariah, uh, brother to Joab, saying, Who will go down with me to the camp? And Abishai said, I will go down with thee. So David and Abishai came to the people by night, and behold, Saul lay sleeping within the trench, and his spear stuck in the ground at his bolster, but Abner and the people lay round about him. So uh, you could just, you know, like I always like to do when I'm reading these stories, put yourself in that story, you can just see him kind of like, boom, 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 you know, the, the, that little music that they play, you know, he's trying to creep up on him, tippy-toeing, make sure he doesn't step on, any, on anybody or kick anything over. So he's sneaking in there, right? And it says in verse 8, Then said Abishai to David, God hath delivered thine enemy into thine hand this day. Now therefore let me smite him, I pray thee. With the spear even to the earth at once, and I will not smite him the second time. He's saying, Look, this is only going to take once. You know, it's just something that was told me as I was growing up. You know, but he's only going to take one of these. You know. Never got one, but he was often told, It only takes one. You know. Anyway. <laughs> but that's what Abishai is saying. He's like, I'm so bad, when I get done with him, you know, he's done. There's not going to be a need to hit him a second time. I'm going to kill him. Okay? And you have to remember, this is the same temptation that David faced before in the cave when he had Saul cornered, you know, unknowingly. They said the same thing, you know, the Lord has delivered thine enemy in the hand, you know, go kill him. You know, and it just shows David's consistency. 
You know, and that's and that David, you know, wasn't just uh, you know, he wasn't a roller coaster Christian. That he was he was steady. You know, and he went in there and he knew what he believed. He had principles and he stuck to them. You know, and that's the kind of people that we need to be. We need to be people who have principles and understand what's right, what's wrong, and and stick to it, even when it seems like you know we'd be very advantaged to compromise those principles. You know, David here would be pretty compromised. You know, he's about to go to the land of the Philistines. He's cornered. He has nowhere to go. It would be pretty convenient. It would probably work out for him, humanly speaking, if he just killed Saul and got it over with. And, you know, maybe he wouldn't be pursued, you know, throughout all the coasts of Israel. But he's a man of principle. Okay? And because of that, he said in verse 9, And David said to Abishai, Destroy him not. For who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? You know, that's, a, that's an important phrase there where he says, And who? Meaning, what he's saying here is, Nobody can. There is no exception to this. There are no exception for those that would bring harm to the Lord's anointed. And David understood this. Even when the Lord's anointed is, you know, behaving very poorly, as Saul was, and he still wouldn't even risk it then. He still wouldn't even go so far as to, you know, smite him in any way. <clears throat> and that's something that we should learn. You know, I talked about this recently, I think, Sunday night, about the Lord's anointed and how, you know, we're all the Lord's anointed. The man of God is Lord anointed, Lord's anointed, and we have that protection. I don't want to re-preach that. I feel like you know I, I covered that pretty well on Sunday night. But that's you know that's the understanding that David has. That there's no exceptions to this. You know, it doesn't matter who it is. That if you're going to stretch forth, you know, if it's another man of God stretching forth his hand against another man of God, that's wrong. You know, there's not you don't get a pass. Okay, and that's what uh, you know because you get to remember in all this, David is the Lord's anointed. He was anointed of Samuel. You know that that's the irony here. <laughs> there are no exceptions. It says in verse ten. And David said, furthermore, as the Lord liveth, the Lord shall smite him. You know, and I just love David's attitude. We see it as we're going through the book of Psalms. You know, he's just going to deliver him into God's hands and let God deal with him. And that's the best way to handle our enemies, is to let God deal with them. And God, because God will deal with them. God will deal with all of his enemies and ours as well. He says, as the Lord liveth, the Lord shall smite him, or his day shall come to die. He's saying maybe he'll live a long natural life and he'll just grow old and die. I don't know. Or he shall descend into battle and perish, which is exactly what happened if we know the story. So these words of, of David here are actually prophetic. You know, it, it, it kind of, all these things kind of happened. The Lord did smite him. You know, he sent Samuel when he went to the witch Endor and gave him the bad news. He kind of smoked him, right? And then his day came to die. It was the next day. Samuel said, you know, if you, will, you and your sons will be with me by this time tomorrow. And, of course, he descended. The way he died is that he descended into battle. And then he perished by his own sword. So David here, these are kind of prophetic words. And, you know, what we can learn from this is that it's important to just leave things in God's hands sometimes. You know, to not avenge ourselves. To not, you know, not to, uh, but to give place to wrath. As the Bible says in Romans. And what else we can see here is that, well, let, let me just say this. You know, these words are prophetic. And, and, I, and I can't help but think as I'm reading this is that, you know, maybe Saul's outcome would have been a little different if he'd learned his lesson the first time. The first time the Ziphites came to him and God kind of shot one across the bow, you know, and said, hey, David could have killed you. David, you know, showed him, I, I had you and I delivered you. And maybe if Saul had gone on and just, you know, treated David with respect and hadn't pursued him like he did, maybe think, you know, this is all hypothetical. I don't know. It doesn't matter. It's what happened. It was what happened. But I think what we can learn from this is that you know, if Saul's outcome might have been different had he treated David differently and not persisting in, in, in pursuing him, you know, it, things might have turned out differently is what I'm saying, if he hadn't been so persistent. And what we can learn from this is, is you need to be careful how you treat those who do you good. And this is very important. And this is something that I think everyone, you know, self-included. I, I have people in my life, uh, you know, men of God, even my parents, other people that I think about. And, and sometimes, you know, and, and again, people fail one another all the time, okay? And I think about, you know, people I've known in the past that were an example to me, that have done good to me, and how they failed in some area in their life. And when I'm very tempted at that time to, you know, criticize them or bring them down. And honestly, you know, often they're, they're worthy of some of that criticism, okay? But I'm also careful to remember that they have done much good unto me in the past. You know, I think about my old pastor, all the things that he taught me and, and showed me you know, took me in and basically was a type of father unto me, you know, and taught me how to work, taught me how to, you know, just do all these things that you just need to learn to do as a man, okay? And, and to be a Christian, you know, the important things about, you know, about being a Christian, reaching others, people and stuff like that. And of course, 
you know, I couldn't get up here and not talk about how good Pastor Anderson has been to me. And we're all benefits of that. I mean, this building, the fact that I'm here, I know it's not me, right? <laughs> but it's, it's the fact that he has saw fit to send someone who happens to be me down here to minister to the people of Tucson. Amen. You know, and we should be careful to be good to those who have been good to us. Amen. I mean, that's, you know, that's kind of what's going on here. I think that's the lesson, is that maybe if Saul had been a little bit better to David for the good that David had done to him, when he released him and said, I could have had you, buddy, and I let you go. Maybe if, if Saul had said, you know what, you've done good unto me, let me do good unto you. Maybe his outcome would have been different. Maybe he would have lived a long natural life. Maybe some other set of circumstances would have come along where he would have lost the throne, but still continue to live. Who knows? I mean, we know how the story goes, but I think the way that, the reason why the story went the way it did is because Dave, or because Saul did not treat David well. And God avenged his anointed, because David was his anointed. Go over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. You know, we can apply this principle in a couple different ways. You know, I've talked about the church, and the Bible actually talks about that specifically. That we should be mindful of those that have ministered unto us and do them good. You know, and I'm not getting up to just say that so, you know, I can just wait for all the good to roll in after the sermon, okay? And let me just say, everyone, you know, I, I people that I, you know, here in Tempe and here down in Tucson, They've all been very good to me. I, I, people have been very generous and kind toward me, and I'm very appreciative. I'm very moved by it. You know, I don't deserve it. I very, I feel very privileged to be in this position and to be able to do what I do. It's, it's my honor. It's my privilege. Okay, but I think part of the reason I was able to, you know, was deemed worthy of that, and I don't say that in a haughty way, is because of the fact that I did that to other people in the past. You know, I served. You know, I. I went to church faithfully. I, you know, helped in the ministries, volunteered, you know, and the, the ministries in Michigan, the ministries here, you know, and that taught me some things, and I believe that helped mold me for this position, okay? So I don't want you to think I'm just getting up and say, well, you got to be good to me because look at Scripture. You know, we should be good to those that have done good unto us, especially in, in, when it comes to the Word of God and ministering unto us. And I'm just kind of clarifying that. I'm not saying that how do we, I'm saying that, you know, I understand that the only reason I'm even here is because of God's grace, because of His mercy. Yeah. <laughs> and really, it is my privilege. But you're in Thessalonians chapter 5. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, it says, Remember them which have the rule over you. Now, a lot of people don't like that idea today, that there's people that have the rule over them. There's a lot of rebellion in our country today and in our world where to even suggest that somebody should be subject to somebody else is, you know, is just the most ghastly thing you could say to some people. It just triggers people to hear that kind of thing. But it's the truth. You know, it's, you, could, you could apply this to marriage. I mean, we're not exactly the most popular group when we stand up and say that wives should submit to their husbands and everything as, as the church is subject unto Christ. That's not a popular message. But I'm going to preach it. You know, this is what the Bible says. You know, and, and if we're wise, you know, we would apply that principle and understand that we should... Remember that there are those that do have rule over us. We have spoken unto you the word of God. You know, so he's getting a little specific here. You know, we can apply that to many different situations, but he's saying those that have ministered unto you the word of God. So he's talking about you know the, the preachers, the evangelists, the so on and so forth, the ministers that God has given unto the church, that we should remember them. You know, and, and again, that's something I practice. I'm not just getting I I I'm preaching it, but I practice it. You know, remembering that, you know, I am in subjection to my spiritual authority in the local church. Now, obviously, some leadership can get carried away with this. And then they start getting in your personal business and they, and they start, you know, meddling in things that are really none of their business. And the Bible's real clear what is the minister's business and what isn't. You know, when it comes to the church house, it's his business. You know, the way the church is run, the way it's operated, it's not, it's not a, you know, there's no committee here, there's no deacon board, we're not going to vote on anything. You know, the, the man of God, who ultimately is Pastor Anderson, you know, any decisions I make have to go through him. You know, I'm just presiding over these services. You know, uh, where am I going? I'm losing my train of thought. The point being is this, is that we have to remember those that have the rule over us. That's something I practice. It's something we all need to practice if we're going to succeed in the Christian life, if we're going to be blessed in God. And, you know, part of that rule is sometimes the minister has to come to you and say, you, met, you know, you did something wrong here. You, know, you made a mistake. This isn't good. I mean, we could go to 1 Corinthians 5 and look at all the sins. You know, fornication, drunkenness, you know, uh, extortion, covetousness, and, and you know a few other sins that the Bible gives the authority to the local church to execute punishment upon. That if somebody's found guilty of these sins, they are to be put out from among us. 
so that they might be restored, you know, so they might repent, get it right, and come back. <laughs> he says, Remember them which you have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. You're at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Look at verse 12, where he says, We beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you. So it's not like, you know, these that rule over you are just sitting fat and sassy, you know, in some comfortable chair, just taking it easy. You know, they're there to be workers, you know, to do the work of the ministry. You know, Paul told Timothy to do the work of an evangelist. You know, it's work to do that. It's labor. You know, the, 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 the apostles needed, they wanted the deacons so that they could labor in the word and doctrine. The doctrine. You know, they wanted to give themselves to that. <clears throat> so he's saying, look, beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you. And by the way, that, that extends beyond even just, you know, the person behind the pulpit. You know, there's people here that labor among us. You know, there's people in the, in the congregation here tonight that labor among <clears throat> us. You know, and we should remember, we should always remember that, you know, if someone, because we're humans, again, and, you know, this church is never going to have, it's not like this church is going to go on and never have some kind of hiccup in it, where people are going to get at odds with one another. You know, if someone's going to have a bad day, say something, it's going to happen. There's going to be some kind of drama, you know, because that's just life, you know, and I don't, I don't avoid that. You know, that's what makes, you know, that's why there's like a drama section at the video store. So maybe you don't know what that is, right? Because that, why do people, why are people, uh, why does that such an appeal to people? Because it's real, it's, it, or it's not real, but it comes across as real. People can relate to it. They can relate to drama, okay? So drama is a part of life. Get used to it, all right? And we're not, and it's not like we're going to, this church is going to exist without ever having some where people are at odds with one another. But I'm telling you this, that if that ever happens, you better stop and think about, is this person somebody who labors among me? I mean, you should forgive them and you should treat them well just because they're, you know, a brother or sister in Christ alone. But how much more so when it's somebody who's laboring among you, you know, before we try to, you know, make ways with people. We should endeavor to keep the unity of the faith and the bond of peace. <sighs> and it says in verse 13, know them which labor among you and are over in the Lord. You know, they're, they're, they're over. You know, ah. And admonish you. Why are they there? Why do they hold that position? So they can lord over the flock? No. So they can fleece the flock? No. So that they can admonish the flock. You know, I've been thinking about a lot. You know, what is what is the goal here in Tucson? You know, we're 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 moving down here. You know, Lord willing. And I'm thinking a lot. You know, this is this is it. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna you know unless the Lord has something else, I'm gonna die in the city. Amen. <laughs> and I'm glad to do it. I like Tucson. It's really grown on me. You know, like a fungus. But um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's beautiful here. I love it. I really do. And people, I don't want to go off on it. But you know, I'm moving out, so I've been thinking a lot. You know, what are we doing here? What is the goal in Tucson? You know, it's to knock every door. Amen. And, and you say you say that all the time. Well, get used to it. Because right. I'm going to ring that bell until Jesus comes or I die. Because that is the goal of the Christian life. That is why we are here. I know there's other things that we have to do. I know there's other things that we should do. But I'm telling you, the reason why God has left us here is to be ambassadors for Christ. Amen. And so we're here to labor. We're here to do that work. And we should admonish one another to do that. You know, I think, you know, I say, I say to myself, I want this church to grow. I, you know what I do? I want, I want people to come, but I don't want to come at the expense of compromise. You know, I don't want to drop some standard, do something unbiblical just to bring people in. No way. You know, I want this church to grow, and not so, you know, we can fill up the offering plate, or I can feel like some kind of big shot getting up here preaching to, you know, a bunch of people. I, you know, I want this church to grow so that we can accomplish that goal of knocking every door. You know, we ought to pray the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Why? Because the fields are white unto harvest. So, I don't know where I'm going into that, but, you know, <clears throat> that's the point of this position. That's the thrust of somebody who is over you or ruling over you in the Lord, okay, at the church. It's not for me to find out what kind of magazines you got at home, what's in your browser history, you know, or come in and get into your personal life, your personal affairs. But when it comes to church house, you know, the goal here is to knock every door. You know, and if that's, if that's not what you're looking for, it's going to be a long, miserable stay, if people were in Tucson, because that's what we're all about. Right, amen. And that's the point I'm making, is that that's... And that's the point of this position. And also to protect the flock, you know, to guard against the wolves that will creep in. Guard against false doctrines, so important to understand that. Let's just move on. If you would, go over to Proverbs chapter 30. You know, I, I talked about how we could apply this, you know, 
of, of, of returning good unto those that have done us good, and not returning evil unto those that have, you know, shown us mercy, those that have been good to us. You know, we should be very careful to make sure that we don't treat them poorly. We should bless them. And I talked about how that applies within the church house. But, you know, there's another relationship in life that we all go through that this is very important to understand as well, and that is parents and children, okay? Well, you know, parent, kids, they often don't understand this. They think, you know, the parent is out to just, you know, ruin their fun. But often what the parent is doing is trying to protect them, guide them, instruct them, give them wisdom and understanding. That what they're actually doing, although it might not seem like it at the time, you know, no chastening for the pre- is pleasant for the present time, but afterwards it yielded the peaceful fruit of righteousness by those that are exercised thereby. I know that's not perfect. Forgive me. But, you know, it, 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 kids need to understand that their parents, you know, they're guiding and leading them because they're doing good unto them. And children should be very careful not to reward their children's evil, or excuse me, their parents' evil for the good that they have done unto them. You know, the Bible talks about this, and I'm just going to look at one verse, because this verse is very, you know, it, it's a very... Makes a very strong point, okay? Where are we at? Proverbs chapter, uh, where did I turn? 30, I was there. 30, and let's look at verse uh, 17. It says there, The eye that mocketh at his father, and despite, and then just love the why, it's like the Bible just described it to a T. You know, the parent tells, the, the, the dad tells the kid to do something. You know, the eyes roll, right? And this is talking about to an extreme, you know, well, they're just casting off all instruction. They're not going to listen to anything. They're not going to be reproved. They're not going to take correction. They're going to mock at their father, right? Which verse are we in? 30? 17. 17, sorry. The eye that mocketh at his father and despiseth to obey his mother. The ravens of the valley shall pick it out, and the young eagles shall eat it. You know, I, I often think about that whenever I see an eagle or some kind of bird of prey out here in the desert. You know, it's just like what that would be like to have. It doesn't say the guy's dead. <laughs> it's a very unpleasant experience. And what does he say? Is, now, is, this, is the Bible saying this, this is literally what's going to happen? You know, I don't believe so. Now, oh, obviously, this literally could happen. You know, he says, don't look at that bird, son. You know, you do it anyway. You know, it gets your eyeball. Right? But what he's saying here is that if you despise your parents, if you despise their instruction, if you don't, if you refuse to obey... You know, he that hardeneth his neck shall be shall be destroyed suddenly and that without remedy. You know, once the raven pulls out your eyeball, there's no getting it back. You know, it's down the gullet. It's smashed up to goo. It's gone. Right? It's a permanent thing that's happening. This is a very severe consequence. You know, what he's obviously saying that when a, when a child, you know, does this to their parents, that things are not going to turn out well for you. Mark it down. You know, now obviously not every parent out there is a saved, born-again, godly parent who's trying to teach you all the right things. In fact, some parents are really good at teaching their kids the wrong things, okay? But if you have a godly parent who loves you and is instructing you, and even if it's, you know, they're strict, good, good. You know, I, I, I pray, I wish I could have had strict parents, stricter at the very least than I had. All the heartache they could have saved, all the shame, the remorse, you know, if you have that in your life, you should count your blessings. Because there's a lot of people, you know, I could point to a lot of people that had that in their life. I'm thinking of one individual in particular. I mean, he just had it all. It was on a plate, man. He had a godly family. They had, you know, nice house. Lots of siblings. Lots of good food. Lots of activities. Keeping them healthy. Taking them here. Taking them there. Getting involved in this. Taking them to church. You know, a godly influence from their parents. And he just threw it all away. You know, and now he's chasing his, you know, his bastard child around the country. Mm. No, he's a bastard. It's the Bible word, okay? <laughs> That's what he's doing. He's moving to some other part of the country just so he can be near the child of some girl he knocked up. His life's a mess. You know what happened in his life? The eagle came down and plucked out his eye. The raven of the valley ate it. And it's a permanent consequence. So we should be careful. Again, I'm making the application that we should be careful how we treat those that are good to us. And if we have good parents, you know, we should requite them, the Bible says. And even if you have bad parents, you know, unless they're telling you to do something sinful, you know, you should still do good unto them. You know, you say, well, that'll never happen. Well, don't be surprised when it does. I mean, it happened to Jesus. He went about doing good, the Bible says. Preaching in the, 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 the valleys, and the, you know, the hill country, everywhere. Doing good, healing people. And what did he get for it? Crucified. 
Happened to him. So don't think it'd be so strange if it happened to you. <clears throat> now look at verse uh, look at verse 11. We'll move on here. It says, The Lord forbid that I should stretch forth my hand against the Lord's anointed. But I take I pray thee, take now the spear that is at the bolster and the cruise of water and let us go. So David took the spear and the cruise of water from Saul's bolster and they gat them away. And no man saw it nor knew it, neither awake, for they were asleep. They must sleep like I do. Because a deep sleep from the Lord was fallen upon them. So again, God's provision moving in and causing this deep sleep. So you can see again, why was David so bold to take this risk? To go down in this ditch, you know, where he's cornered, surrounded, and take these things. It's because he waxed bold in the Lord because he's seen God deliver him. And that can be the same way in our life, you know, as we are, if we're willing to go through those trials and tribulations. <coughs> It says in verse 13 that David went over to the other side and stood on top of the hill afar off. So he's getting some space, right, before he's going to do what he's about to do. And David cried to the people and to Abner, the son of Ner, saying, Answerest thou not, Abner? Then answered Abner, Abner answered and said, Who art thou that criest to the king? And David said, Abner, art not thou a valiant man? And who is like thee in Israel? Wherefore then hast thou not kept the Lord thy king? For there uh, came one of the people in to destroy the king of thy lord. This is saying is not good that thou hast done. He's, he's calling him out. You failed, buddy. As the Lord liveth, ye are worthy to die, because ye have not kept your master, the Lord's anointed. Now and now see where the king's spear is and the cruise of water that was at his bolster. You know, busted. Right? That's what's going on here. Gotcha. And Saul knew David's voice and said, Is this thy voice, my son David? And he said, It is my voice, my lord, O king. And he said, Wherefore doth my uh, Lord pursue after his servant? For what have I done? So he's pleading his case. Or what evil is in my hand? And there is none. Saul has nothing to answer this. And David's calling him out and saying, You have no right to pursue him. Now therefore I pray thee, let my Lord the king hear the words of the servant. If the Lord have if, if the Lord have stirred thee up against me, let him accept an offering. But if they be the children of men, which is exactly what it was, it was the children of men that stirred you up against me, cursed be they before the Lord. Because again, did those children of men that stirred up Saul against him, did they, did they themselves reach out and touch David and vex him or do evil to him? No. But they did it in a roundabout way by using Saul. And in the process, what were they doing? Touching the Lord's anointed. You know, it just goes to show you that, you know, God keeps capable track of all this. And he's saying, look, if it's the children of men are stirring you up to do me evil, and notice David never says, well, I'm the Lord's anointed too. It's just inferred. We just understand that. He says, look, if they're doing it, let them, you know what? Curse them too. <clears throat> I can't believe you curse somebody. Well, you know, men of God and all throughout Scripture curse people. But that had it coming. Right. I'm not saying we should, you know, if someone cuts us off in traffic, it's like, you know, may the, may the earth open up underneath you <laughs> after you get behind me and, and, then, and then call you on, you know. Or someone you know does some stupid thing we get upset about. What's going on here is these children of men are stirring up one man of God against another and trying to vex him and bring him harm. And he's saying, curse them. For they have driven, and he says, this is why they should be cursed. For they have driven me out this day from abiding in the inheritance of the Lord. Now this is to say, go serve other gods. Because remember, David's about to flee. He has nowhere else to go. He's about to flee into the land of the Philistines. And he's saying, you know why they should be cursed is because they're robbing me of my inheritance. You know, and God commanded that they should worship no other gods but the Lord God. And they're they're driving them into a heathen land. You know, where you know where David, you know, David is going to be able to worship the Lord there. But what about his kids? What about his children? You know, if you got out of church, you know, you might be okay. You might be able to continue reading your Bible, maybe even win a soul here and there, you know, keep sinning a minimum. Maybe it'll just run your life over. But what about your kids? Because what happened, what, technically the way it works is that our children do in excess what we do in moderation. But David is saying, hey, if I end up in the land of Philistines, you know, the, the, these foreign gods are going to get worship. Maybe not necessarily by David, but he, they, they might drive his own children to worship, you know, false gods. And again, it all goes back to, we should be careful about how we treat those that are good to us. It'd be a shameful thing if anything like that ever happened. If, you know, I got run out of the pulpit or something and just got carnal or, you know, just got treated so poorly that my own children were just like, well, I'm not going to. Is this what church is? Is it just one attack after another? Forget it. Have it for the birds. I'll go to that liberal church down the street. 
where they don't preach the gospel, where they don't have any standards, where they endorse every you know, thing that the Bible condemns. Because <laughs> one sin begets another, you know, and that's the other thing. Is it, it, if he goes out and serves other gods, it's just going to be a snowball effect. But let's move on here. In verse 20, it says, Now therefore, let not my blood fall to the earth before the face of the, of the Lord. For the king of Israel has come out to seek a flea. He's not saying, you've come out against the Lord. So like, Don't you know who you're messing with, buddy? He's saying, look, you come out against a flea. Who, who am I? And, and David had such a great, you know, humility about him. As when one hunted the partridge in the mountains. It's like you're hunting some bird. You know, and they can be hard to shoot. But they're weak. You know, part, you know what the, people aren't shooting partridges out in the wilderness because they're, you know, they're afraid of that it's going to come get them. And it's for sport. So they can eat it. Then Saul said, Saul, I have sinned. So this whole thing kind of snaps Saul out of it. You know, which goes back to the point I made earlier. That I believe Saul knew what he was doing. In the back of his mind, even though he tried to justify it in all these different ways, and more, more than likely, he knew what he was doing was wrong and shouldn't have been doing it. He says, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will no more do thee harm, because my soul is precious in thine eyes this day. Behold, I have played the fool. So he's just coming clean. And have erred exceedingly. And David answered and said, Behold, the king's spear. And let one of the young men come over and fetch it. So he gives him back his spear. The Lord render to every man his righteousness and his faithfulness. And that's just a real nice way of David saying, You got what's coming. I got what's coming, and you got what's coming. For the Lord delivereth thee into my hand today, but I would not stretch forth my hand against the Lord's anointed. But you know what, Saul? You were more than willing to do that. You were more than willing to stretch forth your hand against the Lord's anointed, David, and smite him. So you know what? The Lord reward thee accordingly. This isn't just, this isn't a nice little peace treaty that David's making. Oh, thanks. You know, I'm glad we could come to a common understanding. He's saying, you know what? You got what's coming. Yeah, you know, like he said earlier to Abner, he's like, look, he might, he might go into the center of battle and perish. The Lord might smite him. <clears throat> it wouldn't surprise David. You think, you think the events that played out in, in the rest of Saul's life shocked him? He grieved, no doubt, and made him sad, but he wasn't, he knew what was coming. <clears throat> Those were David's last words to Saul, because you have to remember, this is it between them. They don't see each other again. They part ways this last time. And those are his last words. And, and of course, we have um, Saul's last words, too. And, you know, Damon's words here, again, he's saying God was coming. And I think what we can learn from this is that, you know, we should never question the judgment that God deems fit. Saul, David understood that. Look, God is going to reward righteousness to every man according to his righteousness. <laughs> he will render to every man according to his righteousness and his faithfulness. So when you see somebody who is unrighteous and somebody who is unfaithful, maybe even somebody who hates God, you know, we should never question the judgment that God deems fit for that individual. You know, we have to understand this because we're, you know, we're human and our, our natural, you know, for most people anyway, unless you're some reprobate who's completely impactable and implacable beyond forgiveness or any kind of compassion, <coughs> even bad people, you know, we tend to feel bad for sometimes. Even someone who's, you know, might say, well, you know, I know they did all this, but, you know, and they, they, did, they deserve this punishment. Can we just let them slide? You know, we think about what it would be like for us to be in their shoes. And like, well, I wouldn't want that to happen to me. But we should never let our own human re reasoning enter into the equation. I mean, if God says, you know, this is what they did, this is what they deserve, that settles it. You know, and God says, my ways are not your ways. You know, my thoughts are not your thoughts. You know, and, and, and we need to get on God's program. You know, and that's a good tip as you're reading through your Bible this year. You know, when you come to certain pa passages, and you say, God said to do what? It's like, that's what he said. Oh, yeah. You know, we might not be living in a society where we can go do that. And I'm not saying that we should. A righteous government would carry out a lot of those things. But if God said it, it's true. And we should never question the judgment that he deems fit. <clears throat> Verse 25, then Saul said to David, Blessed be thou, my son David, thou shalt do both great things, both do great things, and thou shalt still prevail. He's saying, I know you're going to win. <laughs> he said, you know, my goose is cooked. You're the man. I'm not. So David went on his way, and Saul returned to his place. I mean, it was a nice gesture, you know, nice, you know, nice verbal gesture, but it wasn't like, hey, you know, come back. We'll leave you alone. David's still, David is still saying, I know Saul. I know how he is. He can say all these niceties here after I've called him out in front of everybody, but he's still Saul. And he's still going to do what Saul's going to do. 
he's going to have a change of mind around. One day he's, he's, he's happy that I'm playing the, the minstrel for him and driving away the evil spirit. The next day he's chucking the spirit in my head. You know, he knows how Saul is. So that's why he didn't return. That's why he goes in the land of the Philistines. He's waiting for God to deal with Saul. But Saul does seem to understand that David was right and that he was wrong. And really, all that does is make the pursuit of David all that worse. And then we're going to read about Saul's end, and it's not pleasant. And Jonathan goes down with him, which is very unfortunate. Because Jonathan really did nothing wrong. His son. You know, but we can never predict the, the, the repercussions of our sin. You know, we think, oh, I'm going to sin, and you know, I know something bad will happen. It's just going to be me. You don't know that. You don't know the consequences that sin can bring in your life. Who else it could affect? You know, we would read that and say, and we were going to read about Jonathan and say, well, why did God allow that to happen? But again, you know, we're not, who are we to interject in God's decision making? Maybe God allowed that to happen to Jonathan as a warning to everybody else that would read that story and understand, look, sin has consequences. It can even bring down good people, you know, if we're sinful. <laughs> you know, husbands can destroy families. You know, as one, you know, a husband can have a godly wife who loves the Lord, great Christian, and through his sinfulness can destroy that whole home. I mean, that, that's the kind of the application. And the fact that David knows better, or excuse me, that, that Saul knows better, it just makes this all the worse. So just keep that in mind as we move forward. Let's go ahead and pray.